for being here. I notice we have a little bit less attendance on Fridays for some reason. I don't know why that is. You already get three day weekend anyways, I guess. You all are trying to do a four day. Uh, any questions? Before we get started, we're gonna get started on syntax analysis. So syntax analysis. So what did we just talk about the last week? Regular expressions. And yes, regular expressions for what purpose? Lexical, lexical, lexical analysis. analysis. Yes. What does lexical analysis do? Good tokens out of bytes. Perfect. Input bytes, output tokens. Right? And how does that work if we zoom into the box and rip it apart? How does that actually work on the inside? Regular expressions. And when you have a bunch of regular expressions that you want to use to express tokens, how do you decide which tokens matches the bytes? I also want to say, it's the, I think it's the longest matching prefix rule, is that right? Because I, I want to say the longest matching prefix rule. For some reason, that sounds more natural to me, but I guess my instincts are bad there. Perfect. So our goal now is we're now at the next stage of the pipeline. So we've got a sequence of tokens coming from the lexer. And so now we need to transform this into something that's useful, right? So just a list of tokens, a list of id, dot, id, if, curly brace, ID, num, right? It doesn't really mean anything. We want it to kind of turn it into, in the most vague terms possible, something useful, right? But, so let's think about it this way. Is every sequence of tokens valid? No? So let's think about, let's, I'm not going to define the tokens. Let's say we have tokens for num, we have tokens for dot, we have tokens for id, we have a token for plus, and let's just leave it at that. Right, so these are our tokens. How would we describe each of these tokens? Using English? Regular expressions. Yes, we would define regular expressions here to define what each of these things mean. Right? And so the lexer, right, gets in a series of bytes. I have to stop drawing these edges. Right, and then outputs a sequence of tokens. Okay. So the question is, in let's say a programming language, right? So what would let's think about what this kind of means when you have let's say like id dot id. Is this something that happens in your programs that you write? Yes. How, when, and what language? Java. Java? When doing what? Calling methods or accessing fields. Right? So this would be something like foo dot bar. Right? So an object in Java, this would be like on object foo, I'm accessing field bar. So is this a valid sequence of, of tokens? All the time? Right, well, so when would it not be valid in Java? If methods don't exist. What was that? If methods don't exist. If the methods don't exist, so it would, well, okay, let's hold on to that for a second. Yes, because that's definitely a problem. The method could not exist, right? And that's going to affect our compilation. What we want to talk about here is kind of trying to get a feel for what does it mean to be a sequence of tokens to be valid or not valid. So let's think about this, right? What, is, what happens at the very start of our Java programs? When we make a word coding? There, yeah, but like at the very, so we're talking about bytes, right? At the very top of your program, what does it look like? Import. We have an import. Whatever, 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 right? 
and then maybe other imports. And these are actually dotted. This would be an ID, dot ID, dot ID. Right? So if we think about this in symbol, in tokens, there would probably be an import token, uh, an ID token, followed by a dot, followed by an ID, followed by maybe a semicolon. Right? This is going to be faster growing, but that's fine. Right? So this would be that line. So here, an ID.ID .ID is valid. But on the next line, right after an import, can I have foo.bar? Why not? Not in the main method. Yeah, it's not inside of a method body. Even if it was inside of a method, let's say I'm inside a class, right? So in Java, you have to, everything has to have a class with some name, right? And a curly brace all the way down to the class. If I just have the next thing after this curly brace is <coughs> foo.bar, is that valid Java? So what do I have here? So we, let's go back to this original question. So is id.id .id a valid sequence of tokens? Sometimes. Yes, sometimes. But what times? When it's in the main method when you're trying to access? Yeah, so it's depending on, in some sense, the context of where it's used. Right? We can't just arbitrarily throw in any id.id .id and expect it to be valid Java code. There's only certain places where we can actually use that. Cool. And then other things like, you know, some tokens we know are just probably always wrong. Like dot plus a dot. Right? I think so. Can somebody think of a reason why this would be a valid token? Yeah, I don't know. I don't think so. You can think of a language maybe where this does happen, right? What was that? Would this be maybe a valid? Yes. So what would this mean semantically? Like, what does this actually mean? This is a basic addition. Yeah, basic, like, but addition of what? Of one variable to another. Yeah, one variable to another, right? Which would be different maybe than a num, than a num plus a num, right? But they're all valid syntax. And going back to the can you do it, right? So ID plus ID, we already said, depending on context, may be valid. But what if you've never declared that ID as a variable? Does that depend? OK, let's say in Java. <laughs> oh, OK. Yeah, no. Then it wouldn't compile, right? So it would be semantically invalid. So those are additional checks that we're going to look at later about, OK, so right now we're, we're worried about, is this sequence of tokens that the lecture is giving us, is this a valid sequence of tokens? And we already saw we can't answer this question in isolation, right, because this id.id .id problem. We can't just say, yes, any id.id .id is definitely OK, right? Questions? Cool. Okay, so this is our whole goal. This is the goal of, part of the goal of syntax analysis is checking, is this sequence of tokens a valid sequence of tokens? So we already kind of looked at some of these things, some of these things, like decimal.num, does that make sense? No, right? It'd be like, it's like a, it's syntactically invalid, that doesn't mean anything in our language. Cool dot 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 num id dot id right you can have any combination and the lexer will correctly tell you hey this is a dot this is a dot this is a dot this is a num right but now we need to decide is that right and if not we need to throw an error okay so we already learned about regular expressions right yes please say yes you learn <laughs> We can also agree we are learning, you are currently also learning and refining your regular expression skills. We've studied and looked at regular expressions. So if we already said, hey, we want to tell if a sequence of tokens are valid, well, we kind of already have a way to describe a sequence of characters, right, in terms of a regular expression. We can use a regular expression to define a set of strings. Why don't we use regular expressions here to define what are valid operators here and what are valid sequences of characters? Sorry, sequences of tokens. 
So let's use regular expressions. So let's say, okay, so we have a program, right? So let's let's go like this. Let's do it over here. I like doing it. Here. So we have a program. Let's write a program regular expressions. What's a program composed of? Let's say like very basic language. So it has maybe a main method, does it have to? No. No, not necessarily. You can write a C pro a, a .c file that does not have a main method, which you're going to use and import. You can compile that to an object file and then link to it later, which is exactly the .o files that we gave you in project one. Right? So let's think about each line, most lines in a C program, what do they end with? Semicolon. Right? So let's call that a statement. Right, a statement ends in a semicolon. So a program is composed of statements. <coughs> and can we have just one of them? How many statements can we possibly have? Infinitely many. How do we do that with bigger expressions? Star. Statement star. Right? So this would say a program is zero or more statements. <coughs> So what kind of things can a statement be? What makes up a statement? A series of strings, valid tokens. Tokens, yeah. So here we're only talking about tokens. So our, like, if you think of like our base characters are going to be tokens. Keyword ID. Maybe a keyword ID. So what would a keyword ID? Oh, oh, like the ID. Keyword and then the ID, like uh, declaring a variable. Ah, so we can declare a variable. Okay. What are some other things that statements can be? Um, Function calls, what else? Like operators, like plus. Minus. Operators, like plus. What else? Uh, something that can end the program. Something that can maybe end the program, yeah, like a break or a halt or uh, something like that, yeah. Okay. Control statement. A control statement, so if, whiles, unless in some languages, loops, fors, right? Let's go back to the operator. So for statement, so let's think about plus, right? So we have plus here. Wait, let me check the cheat real quick. Oh, cheating's no good. Okay, cool. Okay, so we have plus, and let's say on the left-hand side we have like an operator. Oh, sorry, that plus is an operator. So on the left-hand side, what should we have? Wait, why is it not going away? <laughs> Magic. <laughs> <laughs> now it's just being silly. I don't know what. I didn't want to use the. Maybe if I do literally everything? Nope. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you like burned into the page? Alright, whatever. <laughs> you are all seeing this, right? I'm not like. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so statement <laughs> is going to be, we'll ignore the ghost. So what, what can be on like the, so we have a plus sign, right? So what can be on the left? ID. It could be an ID, and what else? A num. Decimal, right? It could be a lot of different things. Okay, cool. Um, so let's think about it like this. So we have here, so let's just go with nums. So we have num plus num, right? Okay, so let's think, I have a statement. So I have five plus five, right? So five is gonna be the token what? No, no. Num, and plus is gonna be the token, plus. and num is gonna be the token. No. So are these tokens in the language described by the regular expression program? Yeah, right? I have num plus num. That's in there. That's described by this figure expression. Awesome. So what about like this? Is this a valid expression? Yes. No? I mean, in a C, would we like this to be a valid statement? Sorry. Yes. You want it to be. We want it to be. Wow. Do you want it to be? Yeah, right? We want 5 plus 5 plus 5. Right? And what does this mean? 
Well, so we have like the plus operator, we have five, right? And then we have another plus operator, and that's going to be five plus five, right? So here, the left-hand side of this plus operator is really a statement, right? Not a, just a number. Well, OK, we already said we can't have recursive regular expressions, right? So is there, so how can we change this so that we can now match this? Say that again. Plus num on the bracket and the star. Plus, say that again. Oh, sorry, the plus num. Plus or, num. Yeah, in, inside the bracket and star. Ooh, and star. Interesting. Okay, num plus num, so we can do plus num, plus num. So one problem this gets us into, right, is just num by itself. Is that a valid statement? Maybe, maybe not. So we can do plus num, plus num. Okay, that gets us out of this problem. Now we want to do, can we have as a statement we have parentheses? Just the open, just the open parentheses. Well, sorry, sorry. Can we do like a statement like, I don't know, five plus five? Sure. Yes. And then could I add any number of parentheses here? What's the key thing that I need though? <laughs> Equal number of opening and closing parentheses, right? They should be what? Balance. Balance, yes. This was the scale hint. Yeah, they should be balanced, right? And I want that, I want to know that this sequence of tokens is valid or not valid because I want to know if these parentheses are balanced or not. So how do we write a regular expression of balanced parentheses? So do we need a token for a left, for a left and a right? Call it LP and RP. What goes in the middle? Why can't we do this? Recursive. Those recursive. Can I do like maybe? What would this describe? Any number of left and right. But what specific form is this in? So let's think. So I can do left parentheses and then any number of left right. So this would be like this. And then a right parenthesis. But does this match? Wait. Yeah. This one does. Does this one? Yeah. Where do you put in like the stop? It should be because of less because LP because it could be any stuff. This matches? Why not? It has to be left, right, all by left, right, all by left, right. So what are we trying to say here? Like for this one here. What we just said balance. What does balance mean? Same number of left and right parentheses. So can, let's try to boil this down. So this is when you're trying to think about like, okay, what are the bounds of what I can do, right? Let's just call these A and B. So I want to describe, I want a regular expression to describe the set of all strings where there are a number of A's followed by an equal number of B's. How do I do that? So this is the strings that I want. I want, so I want some regular expression R I want it to be, we can include sigma or not, doesn't matter, it's included. Uh, I want it to be A, B, A, A, B, B, A, 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 B, 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 and so on. So what's R look like? A star, if we, uh, cool. A star dot B star. 
What string does this produce that is not in here? A, 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 B. A, A, B, right? What else? Or we can just use tokens to call A and B. So something like R is equal to a capital A, capital B, whole star, which then calls A, alphabet A, and B, alphabet B. I want it. So something like a token which calls specifically A, mm -hmm. and then another token that calls specifically B. Like this? Ah uh, no, not star. Just like it? Yeah. And then we can call R is equal to A B. No, A B whole star. Ah, like this. Um. Yeah. Cool. So what does this do? Oh. Yeah. yeah this is A B, which is in there. But it's A, B, A, B, and then A, B, A, B, A, B. You'll notice this is exactly the same thing we tried up here with this, right? <coughs> so what's the problem? What are your, what are your brains hitting when you try to think about a regular expression to match this? We can't get the same number of both sides. Yeah, what is it about that number, though? I mean, like we, we we're trying to um, make them repeat the same number of times, but if you separate the stars, that's uh. So what do we get? Think about the operators, that regular expression operators that you have. What does star give you? Zero or more. Do you have any way of specifying how many times you want that repeated? No. Do you have any way of capturing how many times did that star capture and repeat? No, not in any of our regular expression operators. So fundamentally, we cannot write a regular expression. This R does not exist. We cannot write a regular expression to capture this. And this is a very basic part of programs, right? If we broke the rule that we couldn't have recursion, we kind of already saw we could easily deal with this. Right? We'd say, yeah, we can have a statement here. I think they'll prove that in 355, but I don't know. Right now you can take my word for it. And so that's kind of what we have here. So this would be a little bit more expanded example because I wasn't writing everything down. We have program composed of statement star. Statements are expressions or if statements or while statements. Operators are plus, minus, multiply, divide. Expression is either a number, an ID, or a decimal, followed by an operator, followed by a number, ID, decimal. And so we can see that an expression is num, operator num, that matches, foo minus var, id minus id, but now one plus two plus three, as we saw, we can't do this, right? But we can maybe do opt num id decimal star like we did, and that kind of gets us into a good place. So the expressions and the ideas of statements that we want to describe, regular expressions fundamentally cannot capture. They are not expressive enough. You cannot use regular expressions to define that set, that set that we want of balanced parentheses. And so we need something that's a little bit more, has more expressiveness. But when we gain in expressiveness, we lose a little bit in performance. So there's trade-offs there. So this is why I said at the beginning, regular expressions are very fast and very performant uh, because they're not as expressive. Does that make sense? Do you understand what I mean by expressiveness? I mean, literally, you cannot describe this R here. In English, we can describe this set R, right? Or this set L, this language described by R. I can describe this set very easily. The set containing all strings that have equal numbers of A's and B's. Right? That set exists. But we cannot define that set using a regular expression. I'll show you other things where we can define using context-free grammars, which we're going to learn about. You can define that set in a formal way. OK. Did that. Parentheses. See, look at all this. Where do y'all do this? Boom. OK. So context-free grammars. We need a new way of describing this. And you can kind of think in some way that this is Relaxing that restriction on recursion, essentially. And saying, we're going to define things that look kind of like regular expressions, but are not definitely not regular expressions. 
and we'll see that they can be recursive. Okay. And the way we're going to do this is with rules. So we have context-free grammars. So let's try to think. Let's try to think if we can define maybe something that could do this. So let's say we have a starting symbol that we're going to start with. We have some starting symbol. And so I want balanced lowercase a's and b's. Right? So S, whenever I see a capital S, I'm going to replace it with something. So what would I want to replace it with to capture balanced A's and B's? A, S, B. Or A, B. Or epsilon. All right, let's get rid of epsilon. All right, we'll do it. Or epsilon. Right? So what am I kind of saying here? What I'm saying is start from S. Apply, well, let's get rid of the ORs for a second. So I have three rules. S can either be A, another S, or lowercase b. S can either be, well, let's go with A, B, or S can be, we'll go with the example that we were, or epsilon. So. I start from S. I apply one of these rules randomly. Let's say I choose rule three. What string is that going to generate? Empty string, epsilon. <coughs> is that in my set? <coughs> yeah. I start with S again. Let's say I try to apply rule two. It's going to produce what? A, B. So I have the two concatenated together. The string A, B, is that in the language? Yes. Yeah. OK. I have S. Let's apply the first rule. What am I going to get? Can I stop here? Could this be a valid string? Why not? Yeah, because I still have some way to get rid of S. So now which rule do you want to apply? Let's go with rule two. Yeah, good call. So what string does this represent? A, A, B, B. So what would happen if I randomly generated and applied every single one of these rules to generate all possible strings that could come from starting from S. Would the string, would epsilon be in there? Yep. Yes. Would AB be in there? Yes. Would AABB be in there? Yes. These are all definitely yes, because we just showed that, right? But would this string be in there? Sure. Yeah, it should be there. It would be this S produced again by ABS, and then the S produced with another AB and so on and so forth, right? If I keep applying rule one, you can generate strings of matching A's and B's. Okay, so we talked about this very intuitively and informally. So now we need to actually define things. Yes, please. What about A, B, A, B? A, B, A, B is not what we're trying to describe right here. Because here we're just trying to describe matching A's and matching B's. And I can replace the A, the A with the left parenthesis, the B with the right parenthesis, and now we have balance for this type of balance, where we have an equal number of A's followed by an equal number of B's. Cool. Could we get rid of the middle row? Ah. Could we get rid of the middle row? Is this the same? Why? Does somebody want to raise your hand? In? Yeah. A epsilon B is A B. Yes. Right. So we go A B. This S would go to now epsilon. What's A concatenated with epsilon concatenated with B? A B. And if instead of this I chose A S B, 
and then that S went to epsilon. That would be A concatenated with A concatenated with epsilon concatenated with B concatenated with B, which is A, A, B, B. Yeah, so actually, surprisingly, that rule is redundant. Cool. More questions on this and this example? All right, let's define some things. All right. So, these are called a context free grammar. We're going to define a grammar. And so, I know so far we've been talking a lot about very concrete things about bytes turning into tokens. Here, we're going to talk about context free grammars a little bit abstractly because they're a little, I mean, I think they're a little bit more complicated than regular expressions and a little harder to build up an intuition of what they are and how they work. So we're going to do kind of first looking at, just like we did here with symbols of S's and A's and B's. And then towards the end when we finally mastered this, I'm going to show you how real programs use context-free grammars to do parsing of really cool stuff using tokens. So for context-free grammar, we need an S. What did we use for, why did we use this S here? What did S mean? Space. Uh, shoot, I guess it did mean statement. All right, you got me. Uh, okay, let's phrase it a different way. Where did we start whenever we were building one of these trees? Or when we were, Starting and we wanted to say, okay, let's find a string that th this language, this, this, sorry. We want to find a string that this grammar defines. Where did we start with? S. S. Yes. Because it was a statement. So we need some kind of starting symbol. So how come I did never expanded this A or this B? What was that mean? Why? Like, why did I, did I not expand an A or B? <coughs> what was that? Yes, there's no rule. There's no, I don't have anything about how do I translate an A to something else, right? I know I can replace, here this is saying, I can replace an S with an A followed by an S followed by a B, or I can replace an S with an epsilon. But how do I replace an A? I can't. Right? There's no rules for that, so I just leave it as is. All right, so we have an S. I'm going to get back to that in a second. We have A, so in, so we're going to call this a, oh man, I just almost messed it up again. All right, terminal. Right? So if you think about when we're breaking out all these rules, when we get to something that's a terminal, we cannot go any farther, right? That's as far as we can go. What would the opposite of a terminal be? Non-terminal. Yeah, something that's non-terminal. I hope I'm spelling this right. Cool. And so S is the start, right? That's where we're going to start. So it's going to be our starting non-terminal. Now we're going to do a little bit less on the formally defining exactly what a context-free grammar is and what it must have to be a context-free grammar. Um, but these are the information you need. What are the starting? What is the starting non-terminal? Most cases, by convention, we will use S. S will always. So if you see a context-free grammar, if it has a capital S in it, that is the starting non-terminal. The other thing, in all of our more abstract examples. All uppercase characters will be non-terminals. Lowercase characters will be terminals. And then we also have our epsilon. What is epsilon? The terminal or non-terminal? You ever ask a question you don't know the answer to? Well, it's definitely not a non-terminal, right? We can't replace epsilon with anything. But it doesn't, unless it's by itself, it doesn't end up in the output string. So terminal, I guess we can call it a terminal. Um, 
But it's something to be aware of that epsilon will need to be treated a little bit specially, especially when we start going over algorithms of how to calculate things about a context-free grammar, which is what you're going to do in project three. So for any context-free grammar, you should look. So even if it's not 100% specified, right? Like here, why do we know A and B are terminals? Yeah, there's no rules, right? We didn't specify any rules to tell them where to go and what to do, right? If we had something like A goes to S, something like that, then it would be a non-terminal in this example, right? But I will not try to trick you like that explicitly. I mean, it could be a mistake, but that's how you should, that's how you should think about it. Okay. So we have terminals, non-terminals, starting non-terminals. So the syntax basically of a context-free grammar is we have a left-hand side followed by an arrow followed by a right-hand side. So you actually see when we get to project three, it'll be really cool. We have, you're gonna be reading in, you're gonna write a program that reads in a context-free grammar and the description of how to read that in is itself a context-free grammar. So it's pretty cool. Um, so the way to figure out this, there's some left-hand side. But can you have terminals on the left-hand side? No, it doesn't make sense, right? That's part of the reason why it's a terminal. Can you have multiple non-terminals? Can I have, let's say I can replace two S's with a B. So this is a type of grammar, but in context-free grammars, no. So in context-free grammars, you only have a single non-terminal on the left-hand side, and you have an arrow character followed by any number of terminals and non-terminals or epsilon on the right-hand side. And basically this means anytime you see an S, you can replace it with a little a, a big S, and a little b. Questions? Cool, all right. The rules, we can call rules productions. So you can say, you can think of it as S produces little a, big S, little b. Uh, you can also think of it as a rule. Uh, we did all this. Start with an uppercase, good. Oh, so we already did this example for matching parentheses. Um, and we can use the var symbol to do or, just like in regular expression. So we'll say this is read, S can go to left parenthesis, S right parenthesis, or epsilon. So it's exactly the same as this. It's just a little bit easier to write. Good. Sweet. OK. So we can do from a context-free grammar, when we did these trees, what were we doing? How did we do this, and why? So what was the first step? What was the first thing I wrote down when I wanted to do this? S. S. Why S? So start somewhere. It's our, yes, you do have to start somewhere. <laughs> and it is our starting non-terminal. So it's very easy to remember that, right? Got to start somewhere. Start at the starting non-terminal. Start with the thing that has start with the same. Right? We wrote down S, and then what did we choose? What do we do? I'm going to get rid of this. We chose one of the rules. And then we basically replaced S with that rule, right? So here we're building, in some sense, we'll get back to it, but it's almost like we're building a tree, right? By expanding each non-terminal and replacing it with one of the valid rules. Another way to think about that is a derivation. So in a derivation, so let's say I have S goes to left parenthesis, S right parenthesis, or epsilon. So a derivation would be, okay, start from S and apply one of the rules. Exactly. Yeah, okay. So we use the double arrow, making sure I got syntax. So I start with S, I apply one of these rules. Which rule? It's boring, but sure. <laughs> Epsilon. Then do I apply another rule? No. No, so my derivation is done. So let's apply the other rule. 
left parenthesis, S, right parenthesis. Am I done? No. So then apply one of the rules. <coughs> Let's go with epsilon, the second rule. Yeah. Left parenthesis, epsilon, right parenthesis, which is the same thing as this. Right? So this, each of these, the double arrows, is a derivation. So this is one step in our derivation. Basically, we're saying, how do I get a string that is represented by this context-free grammar, that is in this context-free grammar? Well, I start at the starting on terminal, and I keep applying rules until I can't apply any more rules, and that string is definitely in my context-free grammar. So we can do this. We can do all kinds of things. We can do it. This would be two, three, four steps. We can just keep applying this, right? Every step is a derivation. Cool. So now if I get a little more complicated, so here I have, so here I'm changing a little bit. I'm trying to bring it back to, to tokens and lexers. So here the token would just be num. So let's say we have the token num and the token multiply and plus, but we are leaving the characters here. All right, so I'm saying an expression produces an expression plus another expression, or an expression is an expression, uh, produces an expression, multiply symbol another expression, or an expression is a number. All right? So can I generate all possible? So can I derive an expression? So let's start with expression. All right? So I can apply one of these rules, let's say the second one. It's going to be expression times expression. But now we have a question. Which of these two expressions do I replace first? Does it matter? No. No? Yes? Maybe? Why? What was that? Because it's plus sign and uh, multiplication sign is the same thing whichever sign you put it. So let's say I change expression and I change expression to three, that's some number, and then I change this expression to expression plus expression times three. I change that to oh, sorry, I went too fast. <laughs> the two, and then I change that to expression one. So I have one plus two times three, right? So is that so assuming these are both num, is it should really be num plus num times num. Is that in this context-free grammar? Yeah. Yes, and I know because at every step of my derivation, I correctly applied one of these rules. Cool. OK. So as we saw, there are different ways of how to derive this string. Right? At this step, we had a choice. Which expression do we reduce, do we derive first? And so this will help us answer questions about context-free grammars that are very interesting, or interesting in the terms of part, in terms of syntax analysis and eventually parsing. So leftmost derivation sounds like what? What would you assume this is just on the title? Which thing do we choose to derive? The leftmost. Yes, for you, that time. <laughs> Always expand the leftmost non terminal. <coughs> this is incredibly easy to remember. So if we say do derivations, show a derivation that is leftmost, you just always do the leftmost one. So, same example. So, you could ask a question, or you want to answer is this a leftmost derivation? Why not? So is this okay? Is this the leftmost? Yes. yes. Is it also the rightmost? Yes. yes. It's only one. Okay. So now in this one, we're deriving the right one, not the leftmost one. So this is not a leftmost derivation. Cool. Is this one? Yes. 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 Is it on every step? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Good. Double checking. Which would lead us to a rightmost derivation, which is what? 
Yes, always derive the rightmost non-terminal. It's incredibly easy. Always expand the rightmost non-terminal. Everybody know they're right and they're left? The left hand makes an L. <laughs> <laughs> In that case. I don't know, you ever do that in physics, right? When you're doing like the right hand rule or whatever and like trying to figure out the forces and you're trying to take a test and you're making weird signs. <laughs> you actually do it with your left hand and you're getting the wrong answers. Okay, so is this the rightmost derivation? Yes. 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 Okay, cool. Okay. So, the cool thing. Basically, here we're kind of drawing a tree, right? To do derivations and showing, deriving things with a tree, right? I mean, I drew arrows, which kind of messes up the tree vibe, but if you just think of them as lines, like here, so if I think about like S, and then I have S goes to left paren, S right paren, which this goes to epsilon, right? So this is a tree. Everybody know what a tree is? What's a tree? People nodding your heads? People nodding your heads. It has nodes. You guys are describing actual trees. <laughs> it's a computer science tree. Some of those terms do apply, so I'm mostly messing with you. A root? What's a root? The start of the tree. Which is weird that we draw them on top. Two roots start at the bottom. So this would be S in this case, would be the root of this tree. Right? So what are some other things? Leaves. Leaves? So what does a leaf mean? Uh, no, but no children? What's a children? We, child, we didn't talk about that. How do you know? It's like an oddly philosophical over here. <laughs> what are these things? Edges, yeah, they establish the parent-child relationship, right? Without edges, we'd just be drawing circles, or not even circles here, right? So I have these nodes, I have S, left friend, S, right friend, epsilon. This is the root, it's the top of the tree. S has three children, left parentheses, S, right parentheses. Does the order of these matter, of the siblings? Sometimes, in what we want to do, in this time. Yeah, why? Convince me that it is important. What was that? Yeah. We're concatenating the row. Yeah. Concatenating the row, and that's not commutative. Ah, we're concatenating, yes, okay. So we're concatenating the row. We're not really concatenating left friend with S and right friend. What are we concatenating, though? The leaves. The leaves, exactly. We're going to concatenate all the leaves together to get the resulting string, right? And so if I have this tree, is this tree the same as Does these, do these produce the same string? No. no, so the order of siblings is important, right? And where does it come from? Yeah, from our production rules, right? From exactly from this rules. Cool, okay, so a little bit of preview. Drawing this tree is the same thing as doing this derivation, so that's cool. So we'll do that on Monday, thanks.